And welcome back to the NFL and You podcast. I'm your host, as always, Hayden Vassar, and uh, we have a very special show for all of you today. Uh, in fact, we actually have a very unique topic on this Friday, January 17th edition of the show, Championship Weekend Edition, coming at you live. Very unique topic that we're going to discuss today at length, and that topic is something called Legacy. Uh for both the players of the current NFL that are currently running around on the field this weekend and those of the past that we're going to be talking about here shortly. What kind of legacy did the players from the past leave behind and what legacy of those players of today will they leave behind this weekend? We'll discuss this topic throughout the entire portion of the show. As we talk about news, we're going to get into the Hall of Fame in a couple minutes. And then finally, at the very end, the previews of Championship Weekend, the two games on Sunday. So, uh, without further ado, let, let's get at it. So, firstly, let's get in the news. Uh, at about midday Tuesday, uh, former Chargers, Los Angeles Chargers tight end Antonio Gates announced, uh, I think he posted it on Twitter first, uh, that he was retiring at the age of 39. Uh, Gates, who has spent the last year out of football, he wasn't part of the team, he became a free agent and nobody signed him. So he's deciding to hang it up, uh, calling it a career after 16 years, uh, 15 of those years, uh, he spent in the league as a Los Angeles or San Diego charger. Uh, in that time, he was a constant fixture, uh, for the chargers offense, a security blanket for whoever played quarterback, if you will, most of that time being Phillip rivers over those 16 years, Gates was elected to eight pro bowls was selected an all pro three different times and he retires with 955 career receptions that's 17th all time 11,841 receiving yards and 116 career touchdowns that's most by a tight end in NFL history so I, I think he's had a pretty good run wouldn't you say Gates was one of the better tight ends we've had the last two decades in the NFL in my opinion and he left an indelible mark, uh, not just on the Chargers franchise as a whole, but in NFL lore. Like I just said, he's been a fixture for 16 years in the NFL. Will go down in history as one of the better tight ends, in my opinion. And uh, he said in a statement on Midday Tuesday, uh, I never dreamed that I would uh, play this game of football so long or how fortunate I would be to be able to play it with just one organization. I want to thank the Chargers organization, the NFL, uh, Chargers owner Dean Spanos and the Spanos family for the opportunity to live out a dream and play the game I love, end quote. So it was it was sad. Uh, I've For my entire football life, I started watching football in 2008. Antonio Gates had already been in the league for a while, and now here we are in 2020, and he's calling it a career. It's it's hard to, you know, watch a guy you've watched your entire time watching football finally call it a career. I've, I've always liked Antonio Gates. I thought he was a heck of a tight end in his prime. He was a tremendous pass-catching threat for the Chargers, and it's really a shame that he never got a Super Bowl ring because he's one of the better players to never win a Super Bowl, in my opinion. So... Uh, it, it was sad about midday Tuesday that uh, Antonio Gates once again announced that he was retiring at the age of 39. But the news cycle didn't stop midday Tuesday. In fact, it kept rolling on into that evening. In fact, it continued with retirement news. As late Tuesday evening, I think it was around like, what, 7 or 8 o'clock on Tuesday when this news story broke, as Panthers starting linebacker Luke Keekley also announced his retirement as well. At the age of 29, uh, Luke cited health concerns uh, and possibly losing a step as some of the reasons why he's deciding to retire. He's battled uh, multiple injuries, most notably multiple concussions over his career. Uh, Luke said in a statement, quote, in my heart, I know it's the right thing to do, end quote. In a lengthy video he posted on social media announcing his retirement, uh, you could tell he was very emotional and that. Part of him still wanted to keep playing, but he knew that his time was probably up. Uh, Keekley will be remembered, in my opinion, as uh, one of the best defenders of the past decade, of this decade we just came out of. And one of the NFL's premier athletes over that period of time. Uh, Luke, Lee, Luke Keekley played eight seasons in the NFL, all eight of which were with Carolina. 
Uh, he was a seven-time Pro Bowler, a two-time second-team All-Pro, a five-time first-team All-Pro, uh, the 2012 Defensive Rookie of the Year, and the 2013 Defensive Player of the Year. Translation, Luke was a dominant, dominant defensive threat for these past eight years. And uh, and he's part of a new uh, trending wave of guys retiring young. Like I mentioned, he's only 29. He is still very much in his prime. And we saw it with Andrew Luck as well, who also retired at the age of 29, very much in his prime. Uh, just to name a few guys who are part of a growing wave of young players who, who have made their money and who aren't up for destroying their bodies anymore and are getting out of the game. and Because they know that there's more to life than just football, is what I'm trying to articulate here. And these players know that, hey, there's an entire life after this game. And that's what this is. It's just a game. And, you know, good for Luke. He's, you know, made his millions and he's stepping away over concerns of his health, over how he will be able to function later in his life with his family. Uh, it's better this way, you know. It's better than him playing till he's 35 and getting, what, like three or three or four more concussions and maybe breaking a leg? It, I know that sounds like morbid, but it's true. It's better that he's concerned about his health now and that he's stepping away. He's made millions and millions of dollars. He doesn't probably need, doesn't even need to work another day in his life. And he's hyper intelligent. He'll he'll be able to find a probably like a studio analyst job after football. I think that was probably the best characteristic of Luke Keekley in my opinion. He was a great player. He had tremendous talent. But that man was hyper intelligent with how to diagnose plays both on the fly and studying tape. And he was overtly committed to all of that. Just a tremendous both player, athlete, and uh, figure in the NFL for, like I said, that entire decade. He was one of the best defenders the NFL had. And he'll sorely be missed now that he's gone. Uh, once again, Luke Keekley retiring at the age of 29 on Tuesday night. Now, we just talked about those two guys retiring, and I want to say, I mentioned Antonio Gates. I feel confident that he could probably make it into the Hall of Fame one day. I think one day Luke Keekley could probably make it in as well. I, I they, They've had such great careers, even though Luke's was a bit shorter than most, but he made such a tremendous impact over those eight years. I, I see no reason why he shouldn't one day get in uh, and grace the hall, uh, halls of the Hall of Fame. And speaking of the Hall of Fame... You see that? That's a transition, folks. On Wednesday, uh, the full slate of uh, the Centennial class, the 100th class to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame was announced. Now, this year was a bit different. It was a supersized edition of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. As 15 uh, new people were inducted into the Hall of Fame. A couple coaches, a couple contributors, uh, and a bunch of players. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, I would like to take a couple minutes and talk about each one of these candidates. I know you're already rolling your eyes because I said it was 15 people. We're not going to go in depth. We're just going to give you a couple bullet points on each one so that, hey, you have a couple interesting facts and you can be the football nerd in your little friend group like I am. I just spout random facts about Harold Carmichael from the 70s that nobody else knows about. All right? Sound fair? Okay. So we're going to go through each one, aim off a couple little things, and then we'll get the previews. All right? So let's start with the two that were announced this past uh, weekend on the uh, analyst shows on CBS and Fox. We're going to start first with Bill Cower. Bill Cower was the Steelers head coach from 1992 to 2006. In that time, he went 149, 90, and 1 uh, as a career head coach in that span. That's really good. He was named the 1995 AP uh, Coach of the Year after guiding the Steelers to their first Super Bowl appearance in decades if i'm remembering correctly they would come up short in that game but bill would eventually get a shot at redemption uh, about a decade later uh, in 2005 the steelers fought and clawed their way to the super bowl with uh, young ben roethlisberger and jerome bettis and they were able to lambast the seahawks in that game to bring the lombardi trophy back to pittsburgh and give the steelers franchise six super bowls at that time a record I think the Patriots have tied that up by then. But yeah, that's Bill Cower. All right? Steelers uh, legendary coach. Finally getting it. 
next next one up, Jimmy Johnson. Uh, fresh off winning a national championship at the University of Miami, Jimmy made the jump to the pros after his buddy, Jerry Jones, bought the team in the late 80s. I think it was like 88, 89. Anyway, Jimmy becomes the head coach, and he coached the Dallas Cowboys from 1989 to 1993. In that time, he built a dynasty, turned a very lowless Cowboys team into a Super Bowl dynasty, literally. Uh, was named the AB Coach of the Year in 1990, won back-to-back Super Bowls in 1992 to 1993, and has been well talked about and dramatized. After that 1993 Super Bowl, Jimmy jo- J- Jimmy Johnson and Jerry Jones, pardon, pardon my missed up there, had a falling out. Uh... Jimmy then took his ball and went to the Miami Dolphins, where he coached them from 1996 to 1999. Uh, He wasn't able to necessarily replicate the success he had in Dallas there, but he still had some notable winning seasons while he was there. Uh, After the 99 season, he retired, and as if any of you know Jimmy Johnson, he likes to fish a lot, and then he eventually became a Fox... uh, on that Fox commentator show. I am really stumbling over my words here. So that's Jimmy Johnson. So those are our two coaches that were announced over the weekend uh, to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. So now let's talk about the two contributors that will be inducted. First up, Paul Tagliabue. Uh, Paul became the NFL commissioner in 1989 and would serve in that role until 2006. Under his watch, the league expanded to its full 32 teams in his years as a commissioner. In that time, 20 brand new stadiums were built. Uh, The NFL Network was launched, thanks to him, and the growth of the game both commercially and as an entertainment product. It grossed, you know, record growths as the years went on, you know, became the billion-dollar industry it is today, thanks in large part to Paul Tagliabue when he served as commissioner from 89 to 2006. Uh, Next up, our next entrant, George Young. Uh, George was a player uh, for a number of years, but he's not being inducted for what he did on the field. He's doing, he's being inducted for what he did off the field as a contributor. George was the general manager for the New York Giants from 1979 to 1995. In that time, the Giants won two Super Bowls, uh, drafted numerous Hall of Fame players, thanks to him, and he was named the NFL Executive of the Year five times. Uh, unfortunately, George passed away in the early 2000s, but he's finally getting uh, enshrined in the Hall of Fame this year. So good for uh, the George Young family to finally be put in the can. So those are the two contributors that are going in this year. Now, we're, now from here on out, every name that will be named are players that are going in for what they did on the field. Uh, first up is Cliff Harris. Uh Cliff played safety for the Dallas Cowboys from 1970 to 1979. In that time, he appeared in five Super Bowls, won two of them. Uh, he was named to the Pro Bowl six times, and, an all, and he was named an All-Pro three times. Uh, he was also named to the AP, uh, not the AP, the Hall of Fame 1970s All-Decade First Team for what he did in his nine-year career for the Cowboys. Uh, next up, uh, Donnie Shell, uh, one of the few remaining members of the Steel Curtain defense that has not been enshrined in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Shell played his entire career in Pittsburgh as a defensive back from 1974 to 1987. Uh, in that time, he appeared in 201 career games, had 51 career interceptions. Uh, he was named to the Pro Bowl five times, a three-time All-Pro, and won four Super Bowls. Like I said, one of the very few remaining steel curtain defensive men not in the Hall of Fame. I was surprised there was still one out there, to be honest with you. Uh, Next up, uh, Steve Sable. Oh, I forgot Steve Sable was in here. We have one more contributor, Steve Sable. But this one is actually very important, in my opinion. So, uh, Steve Sable is going to go into the Hall of Fame alongside his dad, Ed Sable, who was inducted a number of years ago. Uh, Steve Sable helped found Uh, NFL films and became the president in the 1980s until he uh, left the position in the early 2010s. Uh, Steve was a brilliant uh, director. That's the word I was looking for. I almost said filmographer. I was like, that's not the word. Director. He was a brilliant, brilliant director 
uh, that helped shape uh, many young football fans through a number of years and is largely credited uh, for the growth of football among young fans for his directorial style and the films that he helped make while he was in charge of NFL films. Uh, a brilliant filmmaker and football fan through and through, Steve Sable finally gets uh, inducted in his rightful place in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, so, now we're back to players. And the aforementioned Harold Carmichael. You thought I was just making names up. No, Harold Carmichael finally getting inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Harold spent the vast majority of his career with the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, from 1971 to 1983, he was an Eagle. Then uh, he spent his last season in the NFL, uh, 1984, with the Cowboys. So a 13-year career for Mr. Carmichael. Uh, in that time, he appeared in 182 career games, had 590 career receptions, racked up 8,985 reception yards, and 79 career touchdowns. Uh, he was nominated to four Pro Bowls, was named the 1980 Walter Payton Man of the Year Award winner. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, any year, in my opinion. And is also a member of the 1970s All-Decade Second Team. You're going to be hearing a lot of All-Decade Team members named in this one. Uh, next name up is Jimbo Covert. Jim played offensive tackle from the Bear, for the Bears from 1983 to 1990. In that time, he appeared in 111 career games, uh, 110 of those being starts. So he started all but one game his entire career. Uh, you may not know Jimbo Covert by name, but you know the running back he blocked for as he led the way for Walter Payton for the vast majority of his career. In that time, he was nominated to two Pro Bowls and named an All-Pro twice and won that Super Bowl in the mid-80s with the Chicago Bears. Uh, the 85 Bear defense, if I'm getting my years right. He was also named to the 1980 NFL All-Decade First Team. Uh, next name up, Bobby Dillon, a Packer for life. Dillon played uh, defensive back and was part of the Packers from 1952 to 1959, where he had a 52 career interceptions, was named a four-time Pro Bowler, and a four-time All-Pro. Uh, so congratulations to Bobby Dillon. Uh, next name up, Winston Hill. Another offensive tackle. From 1963 to 1974, he spent most of his career with the Jets and was part of the New York Jets team that upset the Colts in Super Bowl III, believe it or not. So, part of NFL history right there. Uh, was, named a pro, was named to the Pro Bowl eight times. Uh, he was a one-time AFL champion and, of course, the aforementioned winner of Super Bowl three. So Winston Hill, member of that uh, historic Super Bowl three Jets team. Uh, next name up, Alex Carras. I am probably butchering that name. A lion, a lion for life, a defensive tackle for the Detroit Lions from 1958 to 1970. Uh, interesting fact about uh, Mr. Alex, and I don't mean to disparage his day in the sun at all. It's just, I thought it was interesting. So I wrote it down. He sat out the entire 1963 season due to a gambling suspension. I, I know, that feels like such a downer, but I was trying to find interesting facts, and you know what? That was the most interesting out of all the guys going in this year. So, a four-time Pro Bowler, a four-time All-Pro, and member of the 1960 NFL All-Decade Team. Defensive tackle for the Lions, Alex Carras. Uh, next name up, and... Uh, in my opinion, one of the more interesting players in this class, Duke Slater. Uh, an offensive tackle from 1922 to 1931, and I didn't write the teams down because you've probably never heard of the teams he played for. Back in the very, very early, early days of the NFL, those first few years, Duke Slater was the very first African-American offensive lineman in NFL history. And he never missed a game due to injury, if I remember correctly. In an era where there were very few African Americans in the league at all, to be the very first in your uh, in the history of the league at your uh, position group is an absolutely massive deal. So Duke Slater uh, finally getting his day in the sun in uh, Canton, Ohio. Uh, next name up, Max Speedy. Mac was a member of the Browns from 1946 to 1952. 
In that time, he racked up 5,602 reception yards and 33 touchdowns. A two-time Pro Bowl nominee, a three-time All-Pro, a four-time AAFC champion, and a one-time NFL champion, and to top it all off, a member of the 1940 NFL All-Decade team. Now, you probably heard me rattle off his you know, career numbers, and you're thinking, oh, that's really? They let him in with those numbers? If you go back and look at his stats year by year, he had two different seasons where he racked up 1,000 receiving yards. Uh, back then in the NFL, that was a massive deal to do that. An absolutely crazy thing to have even one season where a guy does it. But he had two seasons. They weren't back-to-back. -back. I think there was a year separating them where he had over 1,000 receiving yards. So Max Speedy, a member of the Browns from 46 to 52, finally getting his name in the sun. All right, last name up. You ready for this one? Ed Sprinkle. Best name in the hall, Ed Sprinkle. Uh Ed was a member of the Bears from 1944 to 1955. And he just about did it all when he played for uh, the Bears. He played literally every position. Guard, defensive end, and linebacker. <laughs> he did it all, I'm telling you. Uh, a four-time Pro Bowl nominee, a one-time NFL champion, and a member of the 1940s NFL All-Decade team, Ed Sprinkle. So, I know we really ran through those names, but I wanted to at least give you some facts about each one and keep it in a small, uh, easy-to-digest manner. So, when you hear those names again in August, when they're finally inducted, you can say, Hey, I remember Duke Slater from when I heard it on that one weird podcast. Yeah. So, congrats to the 15 newest members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Can we get a round of applause for those members? That's me trying to clap while I hold my microphone. Uh, so congrats to those Hall of Fame members. And just a really quick side note, I don't mean to raid on this parade, but I wrote a new uh, uh, piece. It's not really an article. I wouldn't want to call it an article. I'd like calling it a piece instead about a guy who was uh, left off the Hall of Fame list this year, uh, Cowboys wide receiver Drew Pearson. I published it last night, and the link is down in the description box below. So if you could go check that out, it would mean a lot because it's I, it was very personal. I wrote about my experience meeting Drew Pearson when I was a lot younger, and it meant a lot to me to write it. So if you could go check that out, that'd mean a lot. Thank you, and that's what they call a cheap plug, kids. All right, so without any further ado, let's get into the game preview, shall we? That's why everybody is here. So we're going to go in chronological order like we always do, and that means we're starting with the AFC Championship game. It's a rematch. Both of these games are a rematch, but it, this one's a rematch. Uh, in Week 10, when the Chiefs went to Tennessee to play the Titans, Titans pulled off an upset, 35-32. Uh, that was Mahomes' first game back from the dislocated kneecap. Remember that injury? That was his first game back. He threw three touchdowns, had that great Superman throw, and he looked every bit as dangerous as he ever did. Uh, but at the end of the game, Titans special teams was the real story as they blocked a field goal that would have sent the game to overtime, block it, win the game, Titans pull the upset, and now here we are. Now that game is actually very interesting when you go back and look at it, arguably one of the better games we had this season, but the ramifications that came out of it were just as interesting in my opinion. That game was the last time the Chiefs lost a game. That was it. The Titans were the last team to beat these Chiefs. And in fact, it could really be argued that game was a turning point for this Chiefs defense. Uh, excluding last week versus Houston. You know, this that one playoff game last week. Excluding that game. This Week 10 game against the Titans was the last time the Chiefs defense allowed a team to score more than 30 points on them. 30 or more points. Excluding last week's game. After this game... That Chiefs defense turned a corner. They started playing great shutdown football. Granted, they were playing a lot of bad teams, but still, they turned it around. It's when they started to become a complete team, that complete team that I raved about for like all of December. Now, Chiefs defense is good. We've been over that. Chiefs offense. Good Lord, you didn't have to beat up the Texans that hard. It was not necessary to hit them that hard. They were dead already, but you kept kicking them. They showed that they were every bit as dangerous as everyone said they were last week. If you were doubting this Chiefs offense at all, 
Just go watch that game and call me in the morning because that should massage all your concerns about this Chiefs offense. Granted, they're probably not as good as they were last year on offense. And that's okay. You can't always be an offense that puts up 50 passing touchdowns in a year. And you know what? They're not going to come out of the gate white hot. They're not going to be that team that's going to put up like 30 points going into halftime every week. They're not going to be that. But they did show that they can flip that switch and become that offensive monster better than any team in the league, in my opinion. They showed that at a drop of a hat, they can put up points. I mean, just ask the Texans. They found that out the hard way. The Chiefs are the most complete team left in the playoffs, in my opinion. They are the odds-on favorite to not only get to the Super Bowl, but to win the Super Bowl. They are that good on both sides of the ball. Now, let's talk about their opponent for a second. This 9-7 and seven Titans team. Oh, they defy all logic, don't they? And every metric, they don't make sense. They have a running back who has averaged 26 carries, over 180 yards, and what, two touchdowns a game since week 10. Those are mind-boggling, migraine-inducing numbers. And they have a quarterback who barely put up over 100 combined passing yards the last two weeks. I mean, oh my goodness. Someone make it make sense for crying out loud. It, 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 <laughs> it, it's beautiful. I, I love it. And it makes no sense that they shouldn't be here. But here they are. Now, in case you haven't noticed, the Titans game plan is simple. They're going to run the ball with Derrick Henry. And if you've been watching uh, the talking heads on TV, I'm referring to sports shows, the talking heads, multiple talking heads this week have uttered this line. Oh, you see here, you young whippersnappers, this is how you stop Derrick Henry. You just gotta load the box. He can't get anywhere if you load the box. Now, that's conventional old head wisdom. Says yes. If you just load the box on a running back, you know, put multiple guys up there, he can't get anywhere. But if you've been paying attention to the Titans, like I know we all have because I've been hyping them up for months. If you've been watching them and paying attention to them, you know that doesn't work. You know why that doesn't work? The Ravens tried that. The Ravens, in fact, loaded the box on over 60% of Derrick Henry's Snaps last week when he ran the ball. Over 60%. Did not slow him down one bit. Did not stop him one bit. He still put up over 180 yards. He still had two total touchdowns. He still had that 60-yard run on them. Loading the box is not going to stop him. Here's what I'm saying. It does not matter what you do. Derrick Henry is going to get his. He's going to put up yards on you. He's probably going to bust a, a long run. And that's okay. I'm telling you, you, don't focus on stopping him. That's a fool's errand, and you're just going to get hurt. Just try to slow him down. That's all you can hope for. Just try to slow him down. That is your only hope, Kansas City. Now, that's what they're doing on the, on, on the offense. They're trying to run the football. We all know that. It's no secret. I want to really talk about the Titans defense because that has been a story that I don't think has been talked about enough. They came into this postseason as one of the worst defensive units out of all the teams in the postseason. I, the Texans were the only team worse than them in total defense, if I remember correctly, when I looked at the numbers uh, two weeks ago. They have been playing with their hair on fire these last two weeks. Uh, they, they came into the wild card round as one of the worst defenses in football, like I said. Since then, two games, and they've given up an average of 12.5 points per game. I mean, it's one thing when you know you can shut down a bad Patriots offense. That's one thing. Anybody can really do that. What they did to the Ravens, that was scary. They forced one of the best regular season offenses we've seen in years into nothing. They held them for 0-4 on fourth down last week. That's incredible for any defense. And this Titans team is playing arguably some of their best football right now. 
If they can do that to the Ravens, if they can shut down the Ravens and make them a non-factor on offense, they can do that to anybody, in my opinion. And that includes the Chiefs. That's not a slight on the Chiefs at all. I'm just saying, if they can take that best offense and make them nothing, they can do it to anybody. Now, I am slightly concerned about the Titans. I'm going to be honest. I need to say this. I want to see more from Ryan Tannehill. Don't get me wrong. I love what Winter Storm Derrick Henry is doing. Just putting up an average of 188 yards per game in these playoffs. Just taking it all on him. I love it. I love every bit about it. But I'm a little worried about what if the Chiefs put up 28 to 30 points. I mean, I know Tannehill threw three touchdowns last week, but he's going to have to put up more than, you know, 100 passing yards is what I'm arguing. You know, maybe a... Try to get A.J. Brown and those tight ends more involved. I'm just saying, if if this turns into a slugfest and it turns into a points bonanza, Tannehill's going to have to make some big boy throws. I'm not, I'm not saying I doubt him. I'm just saying I need to see some more. I need to see something more than what I've seen these last two weeks. Titans got really lucky with the turnovers last week, too. I mean, you know, Ravens went for it on fourth down multiple times and didn't get it. They had the two uh, turnovers, the one fumble and interception. I doubt they'll have that kind of luck again. So what I'm saying is the, Tannehill's going to have to make some big boy throws. He's going to have to make some big, big boy throws. So that's what these two teams are right now. Oh, yeah, and I forgot to mention because I didn't write down in my notes when I did this Wednesday night. Travis Kelsey, the Chiefs tight end, is apparently hurt, but he said earlier today he'd be ready to go. So got that in mention that. All right. So here we go. Who am I picking to win this game? The smart thing to do would be to pick the Chiefs, wouldn't it? I, I I mean, I'm not a betting man, and I'm not telling you to gamble, but they're like the, like I said earlier, they're the odds-on favorite to not only get to the Super Bowl, to win the Super Bowl. They're, like I said, they are the most complete team left in the playoffs. And in fact, before everybody started getting eliminated, they were one of the better teams in the entire playoffs. The smart thing to do would be to pick the Chiefs. Do you know what else was the smart thing to do? Take the Patriots to beat the Titans. It was also a smart thing to take the Ravens to beat the Titans. And look how that turned out. I don't think the Titans are a better team than the Chiefs. But the better team doesn't always win. And that's why I'm saying the Titans win this Sunday. Tighten the heck up. Let's let's get it, baby. Tighten the heck up. It's just it's just such an odd thing that we're seeing in the playoffs right now with this team. They don't make sense. They're a Cinderella story. They're much like the 2017 Jacksonville Jaguars. They won like 13 games, didn't they? They were all defense. Their offense was a shell of what an offense should be. But they almost went to a Super Bowl too, didn't they? They were 15 minutes away. This Titans team is the hottest team in the playoffs right now. They fear nothing and they're going to come in and not be afraid of this Chiefs team that they've already beaten once. And that's why I'm taking the Titans to win. Now, I want to preface this by saying, I could easily see the Chiefs winning this game too. And no matter who wins this game, I'm cheering for whoever the AFC champion is in the Super Bowl. I'm just going to throw that out there. So, I'm taking the Titans to win the AFC championship game. Let's talk about the NFC championship game. Green Bay at San Francisco. This one's also a rematch of a game that occurred earlier in the season. The Week 12 game where the Packers traveled to... San Francisco on Sunday Night Football. And then what unfolded was a one-sided mugging. A defensive smackdown of epic proportions as the 49ers won 38-7. As Rodgers had one of the worst games of his career as he barely put up over 100 passing yards. Now, interesting note, much like the Chiefs, this rematch, that loss to San Francisco the first time around, was the last time the Packers lost a game. I know, it's such a weird coincidence. Flash forward to now, and does it really feel like much has changed between these two teams? I don't think so. The 49ers defense showed it was every bit as dangerous as it was hyped up to be as they forced the Vikings offense into a pathetic shell of itself and just broke their will to fight halfway through the game. I mean... That, that was the defense that we talked about for the majority of the year 
and it showed up in the uh, in the postseason. The Packers, on the other hand, still feel like there's something to be desired when you watch them play. Uh, they looked very beatable versus the Seahawks, didn't they? Didn't they? They, they looked beatable. Uh, but Rodgers showed that with the game on the line, he could still make those big-time money throws as he had two big, big boy throws on that final drive to bleed out the clock versus the Seahawks. And that's something you really can't account for or can or can put into numbers is that when, in a big-time moment, Rodgers might just uncork a big boy throw. That he's shown he can still do that. That he is still very much capable of doing that. Now, speaking of the 49ers offense real quick. They aren't unbeatable. Despite what their record says, they are not unbeatable. We've seen uh, them held under 100 rushing yards at more than one or two times this year. That's what they like to do. They like to run the football. Now, their game plan changes every week because Kyle Shanahan likes to draw up the game plan from scratch, and I really like that. But they're going to run the football. That's how they beat this Packers offense last time. That's what this Packers defense is weak against. Should just run right at them and control time of possession. That's been the 49ers' MO the entire season. It's what they did to the Vikings last week. I expect them to do it again to the Packers this week. And like I said, they can be stopped. Uh... Because uh, the, their offense isn't the cleanest in the world. They've struggled with turnovers at times this season. They had two last week, so I still think that they haven't put that turnover bug to bed. They can be stopped. You just got to get to Jimmy G. And the Packers have a pass rushing duo that can do that. So, it was one thing when the Packers defense you know, shut down the Seahawks running game last week. It's one thing when you're taking down a very slow Marshawn Lynch and Travis Homer. That's one thing because that's not really they're Those guys aren't going to do much anyway. Let's be brutally honest about it. They're not going to do much anyway. This 49ers three headed monster where you really don't know what they're going to throw at you. It could be a lot of Raheem Mostert. It could be some of the other two guys whose names are Tevin Coleman. I don't know why I almost called him Stephen Colbert. Tevin Coleman. It could be any one of them that could come right at you. You just don't know until they start doing it to you. And that's what's really dangerous about this 49ers offense. Uh, this three-headed monster is just a completely different animal, beast, by nature. They are just completely different. So, with all of that in mind, who's going to win this game? I think it's the 49ers. I really do. In fact, I would really be surprised if this was a close game in the fourth quarter. I think there is that wide of a gap between these two teams. I, I really do. Now, may, maybe Rodgers comes out and makes some throws, makes it interesting. I, I would like to see an NFC Championship game be interesting. I really do, because in my mind, I, I this game's probably over by halfway through the third quarter. I don't think it's going to be as ugly as that Sunday night football game was. It definitely won't be that ugly or that much of a blowout but i'm expecting us to go into the fourth quarter realizing this game is well in hand for the 49ers that's what i'm trying to say so those are our two previews and that's all we have for today's friday show i know it's another short one so uh, next time we talk will be monday where we'll recap these two games these championship games we'll know the super bowl slate so that'll be pretty nice uh, and we'll talk about any news that has happened since then so Thanks for stopping by, and I'll talk to you Monday. Bye.